Today we'll be finishing up chapter 7. This is the translation portion of that chapter, finishing the idea of how proteins are made from the information in DNA. In your textbook this is pages 246 to 260, and it's worthwhile to say that this lecture is the last of the material that you will see on exam 1. We're going to start off today's lecture talking about reading frames of DNA genes and mRNA transcripts from those genes, and this idea of triplets or codons. These are groups of three nucleotides which contain the information for a single amino acid. We'll then talk about tRNAs and how tRNAs are charged. tRNA charging refers to the process of linking an amino acid onto a tRNA, and we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get there. These first two components of the lecture are really meant to set the stage for discussing translation and to explain all the different players that are used in translation and what their roles are in making a protein. So once we have those players in place, we'll discuss ribosomes themselves, the protein-making machinery of this cell, and of course from there we'll go on to the process of translation itself. Once we finish discussing the process of translation, we'll have pretty brief conversations on three other topics. The first are polysomes. Then we'll talk about antibiotics and how they function with respect to translation. And we'll end this lecture very, very briefly introducing the idea of different points of regulation. So for most of the lectures that we've had together this semester, I've had one or two slides in the very beginning of each lecture that provided a lot of very basic, very general background, trying to put the overall concepts of the lecture into context. I'm going to skip that today and jump right in, because at the end of our last lecture, we ended our material by talking about fully matured, fully processed messenger RNAs that had been transcribed from DNA genes, they had been capped on their 5' prime end, they received poly A tails on their 3' prime end, their introns had been spliced out, and they were exported from the nucleus. These fully mature, fully processed messenger RNAs were translation competent. They were ready to be used to manufacture a protein. And so let's pick up right with those mature messenger RNAs and talk about what happens to them. It's time now to translate the information that was being held in the vault of DNA then copied into that usable, sh small, portable form of messenger RNA, and now it's time to make that transition from the language of nucleotides to the language of amino acids. It's time to translate sequences of nucleotide bases into sequences of amino acids, and amino acids held together in a sequence or a chain are proteins. I hope that tr conceptually transcription was a pretty easy uh, process to master. We know the rules of base pairing for DNA, cytosine's base pair with guanine, and thi thymine base pairs with adenine. And really, if you understand those basic concepts of base pairing, you understand transcription. With the exception that there's no thymine in RNA, the way that a transcript is made is that a C in the DNA is transcripted to a G in the messenger RNA, and an A in the DNA is copied to a U in the message RNA. The rules of base pairing govern transcription the same as the rules of base pairing govern replication. But translation is different. You see, nucleotides are a different language than amino acids. More specifically, we have four nucleotides in that language of nucleic acid. Adenine, thymine, or uracil, depending if you're talking about DNA or RNA, guanine, and cytosine. So we have to make a transition now from that language of four letters to a language of 20. There are 20 amino acids in all living things. So that's not quite as conceptually easy as transcription was. Base pairing alone, obviously, is not going to get us from nucleic acids to amino acids. So how that was possible, how we translated from a language of four nucleotides to a language of 20 amino acids was a debate that raged in biology for a long, long time. There was really no consensus theoretically for how this could be possible. But of course now we do know how this works, and so let's spend the rest of this lecture talking about translation. The very first point, one of the most important points of this lecture that you need to keep in mind and remember as we go through the rest of the semester, is that the sequences of nucleotides in genes that have been transcribed to sequences of nucleotides in messenger RNAs are decoded during protein synthesis in sets of three. The real kicker of the debate that raged all the way back when protein synthesis was still being explored and discovered was that question of language conversion.
The real kicker was how. How can you get from four nucleotides only to 20 amino acids? It's not a straightforward process. It's synonymous or it's, it's analogous with making a, a transition from a more Western language based on an alphabet to a more Eastern language based on characters. You see, most languages that are alphabetic have similar structure, have similar composition of words. Even the letters themselves often have similar sounds in multiple languages. It's easier to learn one Western language when you've been familiar with another. It's easier to make a messenger RNA from DNA because those languages are so similar. However, learning a more Eastern character-based language when your first and primary language was Western and alphabet-based is a much harder transition. It's not nearly as straightforward because the language is so radically different. And this was the not only the problem faced by cells when they undergo translation, but the problem faced by scientists when they attempted to understand it. Let's try to see why this is so problematic. Let's start with the idea that a single nucleotide codes for a single amino acid. Well, that's not going to work. You have, let's say for argument's sake, adenine codes for the amino acid glycine. Fine. Thymine or uracil codes for the amino acid methionine. Cytosine may code for the amino acid proline. And guanine codes for the, phen for the amino acid phenylalanine. Now what? We have 16 more amino acids to code for, giving us our full set of 20, but we have no more nucleotides left to hold distinct information. So one nucleotide coding for one amino acid doesn't work. Let's try two. Let's say a pair of nucleotides codes for a single amino acid. In other words, AA, adenine adenine, may code for the amino acid cysteine. Adenine thymine, or adenine uracil, may code for the amino acid glycine. Uracil, uracil, may code for the amino acid aspartate, etc., etc. There are 16 different possible distinct combination of nucleotide pairs given that system. Four nucleotides in the first position times four nucleotides in the second. There are 16 different possible distinct combinations of nucleotide pairs. We have 20 amino acids that we must code for. That's not going to work. We will have four amino acids left over that we cannot distinctly code for. All right, let's keep going. Let's go up to three. If we use three nucleotides to code for amino acids, that is, if we use triplets or codons to code for amino acids, groups of three nucleotides, then we have 64 possible combinations. Some examples of what I mean here is CAG may code for one amino acid, while CGG may code for another, and AAU codes for a third, etc., etc. So groups of three nucleotides, when taken together, code for a single amino acid. Four times four times four gives us 64 different possible combinations of nucleotides in sets of three. And yeah, that's overkill, right? We only have 20 amino acids we need to code for. So if we have 64 possible combinations, we have more nucleotide combinations than we need to cover or represent all of the amino acids. But we can't do it with one nucleotide, and we can't do it with two, so we must go up to three to give us at least 20 different codons. So I've already spoiled the definition here, got ahead of myself a little bit, but nucleotides of DNA or RNA, when they're taken in groups of three because they code for amino acids, are referred to as triplets, for obvious reasons, or codons. If we assume that that's true, and it is, that is true, that is how it works, if three nucleotides of DNA or RNA represent a single amino acid, then that implies that there must be some known translation. In other words, there must be a triplet to amino acid dictionary. There must be a translation that is known, at least to the cell, that says distinctly what each group of three nucleotides codes for in terms of an amino acid. And there is such a dictionary. Not only is it known by the cell, but it's been determined by scientists as well. We refer to this dictionary as the genetic code. And here it is in all of its elegant glory. This is the genetic code. What you are looking at on the screen here 
is the nucleotide to amino acid dictionary. You see our nucleotides are represented in groups of three, our triplets or our codons. And what those groups of three nucleotides codes for in terms of amino acids is represented. Here's how this table is used. Let's say for argument's sake you want to know what the codon AAG codes for. You'll come first to the left hand position here and you'll find your first nucleotide of that codon, A. Now we're going to come over to our second position here because we're looking for AAG. So we come to where this column meets with this row and these are all of the codons here that start with AA. But we were interested in AAG so it's going to be A, A, G and we come over to this position and here it is AAG. AAG as a triplet or a codon codes for the amino acid lysine. So you can find all of the 20 amino acids and the codons that code for them here on this genetic code. So remember that overkill, we have codons now, groups of three nucleotides, which gives us 64 different possible combinations. Go ahead, you can pause the lecture if you don't believe me, count them all up. There's 64 individual codons represented in this code. There are no other combinations of three nucleotides that is left unrepresented, and these are all 64 on the table in front of you. But we only needed 20, because we only have 20 amino acids we need to code for. This overkill actually allows for something called redundancy. Redundancy allows us to have a little bit of wiggle room when it comes to mutations. Take a look at serine. Serine is represented or is coded for by six different codons. UCU, UCC, UCA, UCG, and also AGU and AGC. This is what we mean by redundancy. Coding for, res for serine is redundant. There are six different possible distinct codons or sequences of nucleotides that all contain in them the same information, the information for placing serine in an amino acid chain. What's the point of this? Well, by having more than one codon represent a single amino acid, the cell is actually buffered against mutations. Please keep in mind, I can't say it enough in every class I teach, it's all about the proteins. The proteins do everything. The proteins are what matter. The DNA is nothing more than a repository of information or instructions for building proteins. The proteins are the machines that go out there and accomplish what the cell needs done. Proteins are nothing more than chains of amino acids held together one by one in a particular sequence. So we can kind of change our it's all about the proteins mantra and say instead it's all about the sequence of amino acids. Same meaning, just said a little bit differently. <clears throat> so, excuse me, with that in mind, let's say that we have some horrible mutation. We say, oh my god, I've got a G, a guanine, and it has mutated to a uracil or a thymine. I can't believe this happened, the horrible mutation. What is going to happen to me? How much longer do I have to live? Well, let's see. It really matters where that occurred. I forget even what I said. What I say, guanine to uracil, guanine to thymine? Let's say that our codon was GCG. That was our unmutated codon. And this horrible mutation occurred. Oh my god, what am I going to do? My G mutated to a thymine in my DNA. That's become a uracil in my RNA. What's going to happen? So let's see. GCG codes for alanine. After your horrible mutation, GCU codes for alanine. Your horrible mutation is not horrible at all. In fact, your mutation is silent. We call these silent mutations because they never manifest in any change to the individual at all. The proteins made are what matters. That's all that matters. So if the sequence of amino acids of the protein has not been changed, the cell has not been changed, the organism has not been changed, and the mutation will never ever manifest in any negative way. A CGC mutation does not affect the cell, whether that third G mutates to an A, a C, or a U, 
alanine will be coded for in all cases, and if alanine remains the amino acid in that sequence, the cell is unaffected. This is what we mean by buffering against mutations. The redundancy of the genetic, genetic code helps to protect the amino acid sequence, helps to stop that amino acid sequence from changing. Now, are there changes in nucleic acids that do result in amino acid substitutions? Oh, yeah, there's tons of them. But the important thing here is not all nucleotide mutations will result in amino acid substitutions, and that's what matters. If the proteins stay the same, even after the mutation, the cell will be completely unaffected. Now, amazingly, the genetic code is universal, with a very, very few and very, very subtle exceptions. All life on this planet, all life, no matter how simple or complex, uses this genetic code that we are discussing. Even mitochondria and chloroplasts, which have their own genomes and their own transcription and translation machinery, uh, we can talk about why in class if anybody's interested or in office hours, but even these organelles that have their own genomes and their own protein-making capability, even they use a genetic code that is nearly identical to the one we're discussing here. Now there's one more implication that arises from this translation system, the system of codons or triplets, and that's the implication of reading frames. So what do we mean by reading frames? Why are reading frames something that we have to now consider? Well, for any sequence of DNA or RNA, if it is protein coding, we will have three potential reading frames. That's three different ways to read codons. Reading frames can be thought of almost as a sliding window or a, a register in the old meaning of the words, like the register of a typewriter. So what we have on the screen here is, is three identical sequences of DNA, well, and that has been transcribed into RNA because we have uracil here. And the sequence that we are considering is C-U-C-A-G-C-G-U-U-A-C-C-A-U. -C -C that sequence is represented three times uh, identically here on the screen. But we have three potential reading frames in this sequence. We can begin the idea of translation taking the first three nucleotides and representing them as a codon, C-U-C, which codes for leucine and then AGC, which codes for serine, GUU, which codes for valine, ACC, which codes for threonine, and then AU something, we don't know what that last uh, nucleotide is, so we can't complete that codon, but that is the first two, those are the first two nucleotides of the next codon. However, we can say, perhaps that first C is the third nucleotide of the previous codon. If that's the case, our first full codon on the screen is actually UCA, which codes for serine. And then we have GCG, alanine, UUA, leucine, CCA, proline, a completely different amino acid sequence than the one above it. Well, who's to say that first C and U are not the last two codons of the previous, uh, last two nucleotides of the previous codon? That would mean the first full codon we're looking at is CAG which codes for glutamine. And then we have CGU, arginine, UAC, tyrosine, CAU, histidine. So these are our three potential reading frames. And if nothing more should be clear to you, uh, what you should see and appreciate right here is that depending on the reading frame you use, you get a completely different amino acid sequence. Only one of these reading frames is the correct one. And if we don't establish the correct reading frame, then we are going to translate a sequence of amino acids that is not in any way close to the amino acid sequence the gene was supposed to code for. So only one of these frames is correct, and the other two must be avoided. Before we move on from this, let's say, what's to stop us from saying there's a fourth reading frame? Let's continue this trend and go one more and say, well, let's say the first three nucleotides belong to the previous codon. So it's C U C A G C G U U, etc. etc. Well look back at the first frame. See, since we're taking these in groups of three, we only have three distinct reading frames. If we go to the quote unquote fourth reading frame, we've actually cycled back to the first. Okay, so there are only three distinct frames uh, to read translation, to read nucleotide sequences for translation.
So which of these reading frames is the correct one? Well, the correct reading frame always starts with the specific single codon AUG. AUG codes for methionine. It is the only codon that codes for methionine. There is no redundancy for methionine. And AUG is referred to as the start codon. Every single protein coding sequence begins with AUG. In addition to that, every single protein coding sequence ends with a stop codon. Stop codons are also referred to as termination codons or nonsense codons. But stop codons terminate translation. So when you're looking for the appropriate uh, frame, the appropriate reading frame to translate a sequence of DNA or RNA, you look for one that starts with an AUG and ends with a stop codon in that same frame. Here's a perfect example. Here's a very short human gene, and it has been translated for us. Up here we see the untranslated regions of the gene. A little bit of the gene is transcribed into the messenger RNA, um, but is not translated into protein. We scan this for an ATG that a ways down in the sequence has a stop codon in the same frame. In other words, we look for an ATG start codon. ATG in the DNA is going to be AUG in the messenger RNA. AUG codes for methionine, and that is our start codon. And then we take this nucleotide sequence in groups of three, in codons, and we go AAU, asparagine, AAU, asparagine, AAA, lysine, AAA, lysine, UAU, tyrosine, UAU, UAU, tyrosine, etc. So we take this sequence in groups of three, decoding it one amino acid at a time as we go, and we keep going, keep going, keep going, until finally we hit a UGA. UGA, stop. That is the end of translation. And UAA and UAG also serve as stop codons. There are three stop codons uh, in the genetic code. This reading frame, the reading frame that begins with a start codon, ends with a stop codon in frame, and, co and codes for the correct protein is called the open reading frame, the ORF, or most commonly referred to as the ORF. We, scientists, students, people, spot the correct reading frame by doing this, by looking for a start codon, and then following that sequence in groups of three, decoding it as we go, until we find a stop codon in frame. And amazingly, the cell does it the same exact way. How the cell does that, how translation is begun and terminated, that's what we're going to talk about a little bit later in this lecture. But before we get into any of the details of translation itself, it's really important to me to be sure that all of you fully understand each of the different molecular players that are needed for translation, understand what these factors are, what their roles are in translation, and how they work, so that then we can plug them in correctly into the process when we discuss it as a whole. So let's start with tRNAs. tRNAs are responsible for matching the appropriate amino acid to the codon that codes for it in the messenger RNA. In my book, tRNAs are the true translators of this entire process. You see, the problem is that the codons in the messenger RNA, they have no way to directly, physically bind to or recruit their corresponding amino acid. In other words, the codon AAA codes for lysine. But that codon, that set of three nucleotides in a messenger RNA, can't interact with the amino acid lysine in any direct way. So how can it be that AAA as a codon puts lysine in an amino acid chain when the codon AAA can't interact with lysine directly at all? Well, the reason why that's possible is because there are adapter molecules in the cell that bridge the two. There are adapter molecules that do interact directly with AAA codon and also simultaneously interact directly with the lysine amino acid. tRNAs are these adapter molecules. tRNAs can bridge codons to the amino acids they code for. The way that tRNAs do this is that tRNAs have at their bottom, if you will, a three base or a three nucleotide anticodon as shown here. So here we have the codon GCC. 
and that codon is in the messenger RNA. The tRNA has the anticodon GGC, which perfectly and complementarily base pairs with that codon. So this tRNA is carrying its anticodon, which can directly interact with and recognize through base pairing the codon in the messenger RNA. So I'm going to say something again and see if you can follow this, see if you can catch the detail. The codon here is GCC, and the anticodon is GGC. Now when you look at the screen, hopefully you're saying, all right, the codon I see is GCC, but the anticodon looks to me like CGG. So what's he talking about? Well, keep in mind, we always represent sequences of nucleotides in a 5' prime to 3' prime orientation. So when we write the anticodon sequence for this tRNA, we write G, G, C, because that is the sequence 5' prime to 3' prime, right to left. The codon, of course, is G, C, C, but that's also 5' prime to 3' prime left to right. Nucleotides always base pair, but keep in mind, they always base pair in an anti-parallel fashion. Don't forget the details of our early lectures. So if RNA in a transfer RNA is going to base pair with RNA in a messenger RNA, it must do it in an anti-parallel way. And so if we have GCC 5 prime to 3 prime, we must have GGC 5 prime to 3 prime. In any event, this region, the anticodon of the tRNA, directly base pairs with, following the rules of base pairing, the codon in the messenger RNA, providing direct recognition of the codons, direct recognition of the genetic code. What's on the other end of the transfer RNA? Well, the amino acid. In this case, the amino acid is alanine. That's what GCC codes for. But any arbitrary tRNA is going to carry on its other end the correct corresponding amino acid for that codon. tRNA, the T of tRNA, stands for the word transfer. And that's because scientists used to describe this process as tRNAs transferring or shuttling amino acids to the ribosome for protein synthesis. But I love to think or make believe that that T stands for the translator RNA because, again, according to me, I think tRNAs are the real backbone of this entire process. They are the true translators of the nucleotide to amino acid language. The tRNAs are holding the dictionary, the genetic code dictionary allowing the translation of nucleotides to amino acids. In fact, tRNAs are the only molecules in the cell that speak both of these languages. The only single molecule that can bridge sequences of nucleotides to sequences of amino acids, the only molecule that is capable of adapting nucleotide sequence to amino acid code are the transfer RNAs. Transfer RNAs are amazing in another way as well. They are actually one of those self-base pairing, intramolecular base pairing RNAs that we talked about in our last lecture. tRNAs are on average only 80 nucleotides long, but within those 80 nucleotides there is extensive base pairing. In general, tRNAs have four regions of extensive base pairing, and that's shown here in this schematic. We can actually trace this tRNA beginning at its 5' prime end, this tRNA goes down and around, down here and around, one more and around and back up. But let's do that again and see that there is extensive, complementary, anti-parallel base pairing within this molecule. Here, on what we can call the top side of the tRNA, we have extensive base pairing forming what we refer to as a stem. You see there's only one region here where there's no complementarity, this G and this U. Then when we come around to this region, we have extensive complementarity here as well, creating another stem which actually has a loop on the end of it. A third region of complementarity gives us our third stem with another loop. This loop contains our anticodon. And this anticodon is actually the AAG anticodon, recognizing the, G, the CUU codon. We continue on to the last side, and of course we have our fourth region of complementarity, a loop on the end of that, and when we come up, we're back to the first stem where we began, and we're at the three prime end of the molecule.
This is referred to as the clover leaf structure because it does kind of vaguely represent a three-leafed clover. This clover leaf tRNA actually folds yet again, giving us a higher order of structure. It folds in half roughly along a diagonal axis, although that's not entirely accurate, but it's the best way to envision it, yielding an L-shaped structure. This here in the center represents the best schematic of the true structure of a transfer RNA. It's very much like a lowercase r or an L that's been turned on its head. The color codes remain, so this blue region here is the anticodon loop that interacts directly with messenger RNA. This green region here is the amino acid attachment point where the amino acid is linked. Again, there's your adapter speaking the language of nucleotides, the language of messenger RNA, the language of amino acids, the language of proteins. And then the rest of the molecule is purely structural, holding the two ends together. This is the same molecule, but as though we were looking at it from the end on. So it's as though we turn this molecule away from us 90 degrees and look down upon the long side of the L. And this represents the schematic representation of a tRNA that the textbook uses in its subsequent figures, and we'll be using it as well. So these three rectangles or protrusions are meant to represent the three bases of the anticodon, and the amino acid would be up here at the top. So please note that even when the tRNA is in this configuration, its true native form, the two most accessible parts of the tRNA remain its two most important parts the amino acid attachment point up here in green, and the anticodon down here in blue. These are the most critical aspects of this adapter molecule, and they remain the most accessible. So before we move away from tRNAs, I think we have one more question we should address, and that question is, are there 64 different tRNAs? I mean, there are 64 different codons, right? 4 times 4 times 4 and a tRNA must recognize each possible codon. So does that mean we have 64 tRNAs, one for each possible codon? The short answer to that question is no, there's not. But let's talk about why. What allows us to kind of skimp a little bit, cheat a little bit on tRNA manufacture is the notion of a wobble. Wobbling base pairs is a non-traditional base pairing between two nucleotides, two nitrogenous bases, that don't normally go together. The most common wobbling base pair is the guanine-uracil wobble. You see, guanine and uracil can interact with, with each other, and they can make two hydrogen bonds. This is a hydrogen bond acceptor on guanine, and it can couple with a hydrogen bond donor on uracil, and vice versa down here. Here, guanine is the donor, and uracil is the acceptor. This base pairing is not correct, quote-unquote. It's not traditional, but it is possible these structures form. Now, why haven't we seen wobble before? Well, what happens with this wobble is a severe distortion of the backbone of the helix, whether it's DNA or RNA. That distortion is what would trigger the DNA repair enzymes, if you remember from that lecture, and let the DNA repair machinery know that something was wrong in the sequence of DNA. But we don't care about the backbone of this RNA helix right now, do we? In fact, there really is no backbone or repeating structure to speak of. We're talking about base pairing of three and only three nucleotides. So who cares about distortion of the backbone? There is no regular and repeating structure that goes on and on and on again as there is in chromosomes. All we're doing is base pairing three nucleotides, and so these wobbles are possible. Wobbling allows one tRNA to recognize multiple codons because it actually gives G, guanine, the ability to recognize two different nucleotides. Now, there is distortion, don't get me wrong. When G's base pair with U's, it does distort the structure of the complementarity. And because of that, wobbling is only tolerated in the third position of the codon. In other words, if we had a GU base pair in the center of the codon, in the second position, it would distort that base pairing too much that the tRNA wouldn't be able to effectively base pair with its codon. But in the third position, there on the end, it's tolerated. Here's schematically how wobbling works. 
If we have a codon CUC, that codon would be recognized by a GAG anticodon. And that is a traditional base pairing structure. In this case, CUC codes for leucine. However, the codon CUU can also be recognized by a GAG anticodon because of wobbling. What that means is that this one distinct identical tRNA can recognize and put leucine in for both the CUC and the CUU codons. That explains our redundancy. Remember, we were saying that redundancy buffered us from mutation. So, oh my god, I got a C to U base pair substitution. What am I going to do? My CUC codon now codes for CUU. Well, don't worry, boss, because you were supposed to have a leucine there in that position, and you still have a leucine there in that position. Since the proteins do everything, you don't need to worry. The reason why molecularly or mechanistically that's possible is because of the wobbling. In fact, the same exact tRNA recognizes that mutant codon and puts the same amino acid in its place. So this is why the vast majority of the, the degeneracy of the genetic code exists and specifically why it exists in third position of the codon. Because only in the third position of the codon is wobbling tolerated. I'd like to point something out to you here, keeping wobbling in mind. Remember, wobbling allows a G to recognize both a C and a U in the third position. If wobbling is widespread and correct, we would expect there to be no difference in the amino acid coding whether there's a C or a U in the third position. In other words, there should be no time at all where a C in the third position codes for a different amino acid than a U in that position. And check it out. It holds true. Never in the third position does a U or a C code for different amino acids. Now sure, sometimes the U and the C code for the same amino acid, which is distinct and different from the third and fourth nucleotide in that position, as in this case between serine and arginine, or this case between tyrosine and stop, but never is there a case where a U in the third position codes for one amino acid and a C in that position codes for another, and the reason for that is because wobbling is always used. We have boxed on this graph right now 32 different codons. Half of the genetic code has been boxed and highlighted here. Recognizing these 32 different codons are 16 different tRNAs. One tRNA recognizes these two, a second tRNA recognizes these two, a third covers these two, etc. That's a great deal of efficiency there. It maintains the degeneracy of the genetic code, but it stops the cell from having to make 64 different and expensive to produce tRNAs. Now, there are often multiple tRNAs for each amino acid. Don't get me wrong on that count either. A single amino acid will code valine for the GUU or the GUC codons because of wobbling, but we need at least one more codon to cover for GUA and GUG. So two RNAs are needed to cover the valine, but still, it's a whole lot cheaper than making four. In general, there's 31 different tRNAs accommodating the 61 different amino acid encoding codons. So the cell makes about 31 tRNA molecules, and that covers all 20 amino acids and all 61 different codons. Now, why 61? I told you, and I've been saying there are 64 possible codons. There are 64 codons on this table that I'm showing you here, but only 61 of them code for amino acids because three of those codons are stop codons, and they don't code for amino acids at all. We'll come back to stop codons in just a little bit. Some of these tRNAs of the 31 are for specific single amino uh, codons, excuse me, but not many. Almost all of these tRNAs wobble, almost all of these tRNAs cover multiple codons, and so again we get some efficiency in this genetic code. Okay, so that's tRNAs in terms of their codon recognition end. That's how they speak the language of nucleotides. But let's talk now about how these same tRNA molecules can speak the language of amino acids. Before we move on to the process of translation itself, we have to have some idea of how amino acids are linked onto their corresponding tRNAs. That process of putting an amino acid on a tRNA is called charging. And 
in an upper level biochemistry class such as biochemistry 2 which is offered in a lot of larger universities we would go through this process in all its biochemical glory we certainly don't have the time for that right now so we'll gloss over it a little bit but in essence enzymes referred to as amino acyl tRNA synthetases are responsible for charging tRNAs and what these enzymes do is they take an amino acid and they pop it on the amino acid attachment point Remember that top end of the tRNA where it belongs. Most organisms have 20 amino acyl tRNA synthetases. Wonder why? Well, because there's 20 amino acids. Each amino acid has its own dedicated amino acyl tRNA synthetase. So, for example, the amino acid tRNA synthetase that codes or that charges tRNAs with glycine can recognize all of the different tRNAs that decode the glycine codons in the genetic code. And that tRNA synthetase links glycine onto all of those glycine tRNAs. So let's say for argument's sake there are three different tRNAs that recognize glycine codons. The glycine amino acyl tRNA synthetase recognizes all three of those glycine tRNAs and can put glycine on all three of them. How does it do that? How does each individual amino acyl tRNA synthetase know its specific tRNAs? Well, the same way that the tRNA itself recognizes its codons. See, the one distinguishing distinct characteristic between all tRNAs are their anticodon. The anticodon of the tRNA allows it to do its distinct job. So the anticodon of a tRNA makes it distinct and unique from others. The amino acyl tRNA synthetases use that same uniqueness. They probe or detect the anticodon sequence of the tRNA and use that to answer the question, is this the tRNA from my amino acid or not? In addition to that, there are also specific sequences of RNA in the amino attachment point of different tRNAs, and amino acyl tRNA synthetases use those unique sequences as well. So these are the differences that distinguish different tRNAs that these charging enzymes, these amino acyl tRNA synthetases, use to distinguish them and more importantly to put the, the right and correct amino acid on the right and appropriate tRNA. Without these amino acyl tRNA synthetases, translation would be impossible because we would have no proper correspondence between the tRNA and the amino acid it should have. I encourage you to watch movie 7.6 which is posted on Canvas. It does a very good although simple and overview job of showing the structure of TNAs, of giving a very brief overview of their function, as well as very briefly mentioning how they're charged. Okay, so about halfway through this lecture, more or less, at least in slide number, and finally we can start talking about translation. All these different players are involved and all these different players are important. Now we have some idea of what they do and we can begin to discuss translation. I'm going to handle translation much the way we handle transcription. I think it's simpler to talk about the actual process of translation first. It's complicated, but I think we need that foundation under us. And then we'll kind of back up a little bit and talk about how translation starts. And then we'll finish that discussion up while talking, by talking about how translation terminates or ends. Again, I think discussing how it starts doesn't make much sense when you don't know what's going to happen next. So we'll kind of pick up translation in the middle, which is what we did for transcription. So it seems to me we covered all our bases. I think we have everybody we need for this, right? We have our tRNA synthetases. These are our charging enzymes. We can say that these enzymes know the codon to amino acid dictionary by heart. I think it's safe to say that these are the players that um, read the language of tRNAs and know what amino acid to put in their place. They're actually inserting the right words into the dictionaries where they go. tRNA synthetases can look at an anticodon, immediately know what amino acid should be linked to that tRNA and put that appropriate amino acid onto that tRNA. Once we have our charged tRNAs, they are the true translators. They facilitate the translation because they speak both languages. They can physically interact with the messenger RNA codons through direct base pairing. And on their other end, they have the right amino acid that was put there by charging. And so they are 
physically recruiting the correct amino acid to the appropriate codon during translation. So what else do we need? We've got the thing that puts the right amino acid on the tRNA. We've got the tRNA itself, which can bring the right amino acid to the appropriate codon. What are ribosomes? And why have I been referring to them as the protein-making machinery when it seems like we've got everything we need already to make proteins? The answer is in the analogy. The tRNAs, the synthetases, and everything else we've discussed, they're the machines that make the product. They are the machines that make the protein. But like any good factory, what good are your machines if you don't have a place to put them all? And more importantly, what's the most important thing in an automated, self-running factory? Coordination and synchronization. You can't have machines running around non-coordinated trying to build something. It'll never work. You have to have that assembly line conveyor belt process where each machine is doing what it was made to do at the right time in the right place to make the right product. The key to complex processes is coordination, and ribosomes provide that coordination. They are the factory building that assures that each machine is in the right place, doing its function when it should be done. So ribosomes. Ribosomes, much like the spliceosome we recently talked about, are huge, huge conglomerations of both RNA molecules and proteins that come together to form this multi-multi-protein complex, multi-multi-subunit complex that has a single responsibility, and that's the responsibility of making proteins. Here is the ribosome schematically broken down. It's actually considered in two parts. They're referred to as the small subunit, laughably, actually, and the larger subunit. Those two subunits come together to form the full ribosome. The reason why I say laughably for the small subunit is the small subunit is actually made up of 33 different individual proteins as well as usually one very long RNA. The larger subunit is in fact larger than that, made up of 49 proteins and three different RNA molecules. These two subunits independently come together, independently form, I should say, and then they come together to form this huge complex of the ribosome. Ribosomes tend to be, on average, 100 times larger than the average protein, so even the quote-unquote small subunit is huge. It's just smaller than the other subunit. In fact, the ribosome is one of the few proteins that can be seen in an electron microscope. Most proteins are too small even for that technology, but ribosomes are big enough to be seen by a microscope. Eukaryotic and prokaryotic ribosomes are extremely similar in their structure, as well as in their mechanism. It's interesting that in the fine, fine details of the processes, there are distinct differences, and we'll get to, get, get to that at the very end of the lecture. But essentially, all these basic concepts I'll be going through in the next few slides are true of both bacterial cells as well as ours. The smaller subunit has a pretty distinct job. Its job is to coordinate tRNA recognition with messenger RNA codons. So the small subunit is really there just to facilitate codon recognition in the message by transfer RNAs. The larger subunit kind of does the other half of that process, which is building the actual chain of amino acids. The larger subunit catalyzes the formation of peptide bonds. And peptide bonds are the covalent bonds that hold amino acids together in a chain. Well, making a chain of amino acids is making a protein. And so the larger subunit actually builds the protein for us. So the first thing, well, not the first thing, we're talking about the middle of the process here, but the first thing we'll discuss is that the messenger RNA actually lies right in the middle between the small and large subunit. So if you think of this as a hamburger bun, where the bottom or small subunit is the bottom half of the bun and the large subunit of the ribosome is the top half, the messenger RNA is the burger in the middle. It actually lies between those two subunits. When translation is initiated, which again we'll talk about in just a moment, Part of that translation initiation process is assuring that the messenger RNA is properly situated between these two subunits, and even more importantly, lined up so that the start codon at the 5' end is near the proper place of the ribosome.
In the larger subunit of the ribosome, there are three voids, or, or hollows, or slots, three places where there is nothing, no RNA, no protein, no anything. Each of these hollows, or these slots, are shaped perfectly to accommodate a transfer RNA. Now, we've said it a few times already, but when it comes to proteins, when it comes to biochemistry, structure equals function. Shape dictates activity. Things in a cell do the job that they do because of the shapes that they have, period. So if you have a void in a, in a ribosome, if you have a void in any protein, and it is shaped perfectly to accommodate a transfer RNA, it has that shape for a reason to accommodate a transfer RNA. So this is our first kind of real-world example of structure equals function, but that is the hallmark characteristic of all protein biochemistry. Shape gives activity. These are the three voids in the ribosome. They're called the A site, the P site, and the E site, which we'll define in just a second, but theoretically or in principle, a transfer RNA can fit in each of these three sites. The A site is named such because it accommodates an amino acyl tRNA. Amino acyl tRNAs have a single amino acid on them. They carry single amino acids. The P site has that name because of the uh, term peptidyl tRNA. Peptidyl tRNAs carry peptide chains of amino acids on them. So in other words, at the amino acid attachment point, there is a long multi-amino acid chain coming off from there. The E site is called exit because this is the region from which tRNAs leave the ribosome when their job is done. So please keep in mind that the site name describes the type of tRNA that occupies that site. I told you on the first day of class that I won't hold you so responsible for terminology. You'll have no defining of terms, there'll be no fill-ins on exams, etc, etc, etc. But still, these things were given these names for a purpose. The, the names describe the function, and the function you most certainly are responsible for. So if you know why the A site is called the A site, why the P site is called the P site, why the E site is called the E site, you'll never have to memorize what those sites do. You'll know from the names of the tRNAs in them what's going on. All right, so let's do it. Let's talk about translation. The very first thing that happens is the ribosome assembles around the messenger RNA, makes that messenger RNA the burger in the bun, situates itself at the five prime end, and then we're ready to go. Let's imagine that translation's been going on for a while because we're going to pick up in the middle of it. Translation is a very stepwise and repeating process. We're going to discuss four different steps that occur, and then they occur again to put on the next amino acid, and then they occur again to put on the next amino acid, and then they occur again to put on the next amino acid. So it's very, very repeating. All right, so translation's been going on for a while, okay? And now we're going to zoom in and we're going to start to watch it. The first thing that happens on this repeating round of translation is that a tRNA with the correct and appropriate anticodon enters the A site of the ribosome. It's carrying on it the correct amino acid for that codon, and the anticodon of the tRNA is going to base pair to the codon. Next, the amino acid that's held by that tRNA in the A site is going to form a peptide bond with the amino acid chain that's hanging off of the tRNA sitting in the P site. That new peptide bond formation is going to transfer the entire amino acid chain from the tRNA in the P site to the tRNA in the A site. I sympathize. I understand you're probably lost. And that's okay. Bear with me. Try to get what you can, and I'm pretty sure it'll all be clear when we're done. Now, the entire ribosome is going to shift forward in the three prime direction by a single codon, while the tRNAs themselves stay put and remain base paired with the codons they were initially bound to. This is almost like pulling the tablecloth out from under the dinnerware and the vases. Some things are moving while other things aren't. The vases and the dinnerware are the um, tRNAs, 
and the tablecloth itself represents the ribosome. This idea of a ribosome moving forward while tRNAs stay put is translocation, and the end result of it is that every tRNA moves back a slot. The tRNA that was in the P site translocates to the E site. The tRNA that was in the A site now enters the P site. And the A site, which was holding a tRNA, is now vacant and ready to accommodate a new tRNA. Here's the catch. The rule of a ribosome in a living cell is that it can only accommodate two RNAs in, at, at one time. There are three slots, sure, but only two of them can be filled at once. So we left it with a tRNA in the E site, a tRNA in the P site, and a vacant A site. The new next tRNA will enter the A site, and as soon as that happens, that means three is in the ribosome, that's a no-no. So when the new tRNA comes into the A site, the old tRNA exits the E site. The E site becomes vacant, only two RNAs are in there, and the process repeats. Mad? <laughs> Getting a little bit frustrated? Let's do it all again. But let's do it again with pictures instead of words. You have the notes. If you'd like, you can print them out, or you can consult with them on some other device if you want to read along as I go through it. I'm doing this from my head, so what I say might not match the notes exactly, but this time we're going to talk about the same exact process identically, but we're going to use pictures as our frame of reference instead of the text on the slides. So we start off exactly where we started off before. We have a tRNA coming in with its single amino acid entering the A site. Now there's a lot going on here. This is an amino acyl tRNA. That means it's carrying only one amino acid, and that's why it enters the A site, because A stands for amino acyl. So this tRNA enters the A site, carrying its one single number four amino acid. This tRNA has the exact appropriate anticodon matching the codon that we see here. That's step one. Step two peptide bond formation. A peptide bond is going to form between these two amino acids, amino acid number three and amino acid number four. Amino acids are only allowed to have two external bonds at any one time. Right now, amino acid number three has one of its bond with the peptidyl tRNA, and the other bond is holding it to the chain of amino acids that we see here. It is the third link in that chain. As soon as this peptide bond forms between amino acid number 3 and amino acid number 4, this bond, tethering the chain to this tRNA, must be severed. So this bond is broken, while a new pep peptide bond is made between amino acid number 3 and amino acid number 4. Now that chain of amino acids doesn't float away because amino acid 4 remains bound to its tRNA and we have increased the chain of amino acids by one. Instead of three amino acids on that chain, we have now added the fourth. However, this is a big no-no, because this tRNA down here is no longer holding a single amino acid, making it amino acyl. It is holding now a chain of amino acids, making it peptidyl. And peptidyl tRNAs belong in P sites not in A sites. So the ribosome is forced to translocate. The ribosome moves forward by one codon in the three prime direction. First the top half moves, then the bottom half moves. This is translocation. But I told you that the tRNAs stay put during translocation. Well, damn it, they did. Look, here is the yellow codon positioned under the E site, the yellow codon positioned under the E site. Now the yellow codon has exited the ribosome. The purple tRNA is bound to the purple sequence. Purple tRNA, purple anticodon, and post-translocation, purple tRNA, purple anticodon. The blue tRNA with the blue codon, blue with blue. After translocation, blue with blue. The tRNAs have not changed the codons that they are interacting with. The tRNA and the mRNA has not moved. The ribosome has moved out from under it. 
forward by one codon. Okay, so now we have an empty, expended tRNA in the E site. We luckily whew, have our peptidyl tRNA carrying our peptide chain in the P site, and we have a vacant A site positioned over the next codon. Next step, in comes our new tRNA. It is an amino acyl tRNA carrying a single amino acid appropriate for that codon. But you can only have two tRNAs in the ribosome at any one time, so as soon as this amino acyl tRNA enters the A site, bye bye out goes this expended tRNA from the E site, leaving only two tRNAs in the ribosome at any one time. What happens next, you ask, dying to know? Peptide bond forms between these two amino acids. This amino acid can only have two bonds, so if this peptide bond forms here, we're going to sever this bond here. That places the entire chain on this tRNA. It increases the chain by one amino acid. This peptidyl tRNA can't stay in the A site, so it's time to translocate forward. Boom. Then comes a new tRNA carrying amino acid number six. As soon as that tRNA enters the A site, expended tRNA number four, which translocated to the E site, must leave, and peptide bond formation, translocation, and then it repeats again. This is a repeating process that goes on and on and on until finally there is a stop codon in the A site, and that's when we have termination, which we'll talk about in a second. If you're ever bored, look at the bottle of shampoo in your bathroom. Most shampoo bottles come with directions, as crazy as that is, uh, directions for using shampoo. And most of those shampoo bottle directions tell you to wash, rinse, and repeat. So the washing makes sense. That's the point of the shampoo in the first place. Rinsing makes a lot of sense, too. I don't know if you've ever left shampoo in without rinsing it, but it makes a complete mess. Just ask my six-year-old daughter. I've never really gotten the repeat part, why it's necessary to do this more than once. And of course, since repeat is the last step, that's kind of like an infinite loop of constantly washing, rinsing, and repeating. The reason why I bring all this insanity up is because wash, rinse, repeat is really the best description of any generic biological process out there. Almost every single biological process is monotonously repetitive. Once these processes get set in motion, the same exact things typically happen again and again and again until some cellular mechanism exists to stop it. And then it remains off for a long, long time until some cellular mechanism exists to start it again. And then it wash, rinse, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat again and again and again. Translation is no exception to that rule whatsoever. The steps of translation are extremely simple and straightforward. It is really a four and a half step process. And the reason why I say a half is because the very, very end of step four leads you right into the very, very beginning of step one. So take your time to understand this, but please don't be intimidated by the process. There's really a very limited number of things going on here that each lead to the next. So the messenger RNA is basically pulled through the ribosome like a strip of tape through a tape dispenser. And as that messenger RNA is pulled through the ribosome, codons themselves transit from A sites to P sites to E sites. And tRNAs are going to track along with those codons. In the A site, the tRNA brings in a single amino acid. Transiting, transiting to the P site, those amino acids are linked onto the end of the growing polypeptide chain of amino acids. And then as those tRNAs enter the E site, they are bounced from the rear end of the ribosome, leaving the process. That means the messenger RNA is decoded one codon at a time, one amino acid at a time, with the tRNAs serving as adapters that recruit in the appropriate amino acids only when the corresponding and appropriate codon is present. I hope now that you agree with me and appreciate why I think of tRNAs as translator RNAs, because they truly are bridging these two processes and they truly are responsible for protein synthesis in the language of nucleotides. Amazing, amazing process.
Eukaryotic ribosomes have a rate of about two amino acids per second. They can add two amino acids to a growing chain per second. Pretty fast. Uh, nothing like replication, but still pretty fast. Bacterial ribos ribosomes are about ten times faster, just because bacteria are simpler systems. And we keep doing this. We keep washing, rinsing, and repeating until we reach a stop codon. Once a stop codon is reached, termination is actually a pretty simple, straightforward process. So let's fill in the gaps now. Hopefully you're relatively comfortable with initiation, oh, I'm sorry, with the process of translation. So let's go to how we start and how we stop. During translation, when translation is going, when we're in the wash, rinse, repeat stage of translation, every single incoming tRNA carries a single amino acid, and so it must enter the ribosome through the A site, the amino acyl site. But this isn't possible for initiation. For initiation, for the beginning of translation to occur, we actually have to have something in the P site. So to start translation, we actually need a specific and unique tRNA that, above all else, has the ability to enter the peptidyl site, the P site of the ribosome, despite the fact that it carries only one amino acid, making it an amino acyl tRNA. In other words, the initiator tRNA is built so that it can break the rule and be a single amino acid carrying tRNA in the P site where it doesn't belong. This initiator tRNA to begin the process of translation first associates only with the small ribosomal subunit. Remember the start codon is AUG. AUG and only AUG codes for methionine, so the initiator tRNA carries on it the amino acid methionine. Sometimes in bacterial cells it carries a modified form of methionine. This is a methionine that has been formulated. It carries a formyl group. So you may in some books or some sources see the initiator tRNA referred to as carrying the F-met amino acid, and that F just stands for formal. Okay, so step one is the initiator tRNA associates with the small ribosomal subunit, and then that small ribosomal subunit, along with the initiator tRNA, is going to bind to the three, I'm sorry, to the five prime end to the beginning of a messenger RNA. Now, while that small subunit of the ribosome interacts with the five prime end of the messenger RNA, it's going to keep that initiator tRNA with it. And so starting at the very, very beginning of the messenger RNA, that small subunit of the ribosome, along with the initiator tRNA, is going to begin scanning that messenger RNA, starting at the 5' prime end and working their way down towards the 3' prime end, scanning for that first AUG start codon. That means the transfer RNA has a CAU anticodon. So here we go. We've had our association first, and now this complex has successfully engaged with the 5' prime end of a messenger RNA, and we are going to scan, chugga, 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 down this line, looking, looking, looking for the AUG. As soon as that AUG is found, and what we really mean by that is as soon as the initiator tRNA finds its appropriate complementary set of bases, the initiator tRNA is going to stably base pair to the start codon. And that is a signal to the complex that it's time for the large ribosomal subunit to join the party and associate with the complex so that, and here's the key, so that the initiator tRNA falls into the P site. So again, we began engaged, we're scanning, scanning, scanning. The initiator tRNA finds and base pairs to the start codon. Here the scanning stops. The next step is the large subunit comes in, kind of sits over or lands on this small subunit initiator tRNA complex, and it lands in such a way that the methionine tRNA is in the P site. I stress that the initiator tRNA is the only amino acyl tRNA that can enter the ribosome P site directly. It is the only time that a non-peptidyl tRNA is in the peptidyl site. It's also important to stress here the idea of the reading frame. 
Remember, when we talked about reading frames, we said, how, how, how is it possible that the cell can find the correct reading frame when there are two other incorrect frames? And we said, well, what the cell does is what the scientist does. They start at the beginning of a coding sequence, and they find the first start codon, and they use that start codon to establish the reading frame, and then they just keep translating and translating in groups of three until a stop codon is found. Well, we just saw that here. What happened? We had a tRNA land at the beginning of a messenger RNA sequence and scan and scan until it found the first start codon. So just keep in mind, without this type of process or any process like it, uh, we would translate the wrong frame. And if we translate the wrong frame, we have a completely garbled sequence of amino acids that is in no way close to the protein we were trying to make. And obviously, that's going to pose a big problem for the cell. Best case scenario is that protein that is made has no function at all, and so the cell wasted all of that energy and all of those resources making unnecessary protein. Worst case scenario is whatever garbled sequence of amino acids is made has some unintended function, and now you've got this machine running around in the cell doing Lord knows what without any regulation or without any um, cellular pre-planning, if you will. So we need that proper reading frame. We need to translate these sequences in the proper order. We as scientists recognize the open reading frame, the ORF, by looking for the first AUG in a transcribed sequence. And the cells do the very same thing with this scanning mechanism, where the initiator tRNA kind of scans along with a small subunit of the ribosome, looking for the first AUG. So everything we've just discussed happens both in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. There's no real difference in the general concepts of, of how initiation begins. Where the distinctions begin to become important is in the how. How do cells that are bacterial find and bind to the beginning of messenger RNAs compared to how do eukaryotic cells find and bind to the beginning of messenger RNAs? In bacterial cells, the small ribosomal subunit carries with it a ribosomal RNA, we've talked about those before, which binds directly to a sequence in the messenger RNA called the Schein-Delgarno sequence. Now, the Schein-Delgarno sequence is in the 5' prime UTR of the messenger RNA. You might remember we talked about 3' prime UTRs in a previous lecture. UTR stands for untranslated region. So certainly on every messenger RNA, there is RNA sequence in front of, before, or 5' prime of the AUG start codon. Because these nucleotides are before the AUG start codon, they are never translated into amino acid. So they are called untranslated regions. They're 5' prime untranslated regions because they're at the beginning of the messenger RNA. Within some of these untranslated pre-AUG start codon sequences is the Schein-Delgarno sequence in bacterial genes. There's a ribosomal RNA in the small subunit of the ribosomal of the bacterial ribosome that can base pair with this unique and specific Schein-Delgarno sequence. So here is your bacterial messenger RNA, or the beginning of it at least. Here is your start codon AUG. This marks the beginning of the translated region of this messenger RNA. And five prime of that, in front of that, are untranslated sequences, a UTR, including the specific Schein-Delgarno sequence. I'll never ask you to recount the Schein-Delgarno sequence. It's not something you have to memorize. The ribosomal RNA, which is part of the small subunit of the bacterial ribosome, has on it the perfect complementary base pair sequence for that Schein-Delgarno. It's almost the anti-Schein-Delgarno sequence, if you will. It base pairs perfectly, and it is anti-parallel, 5 to 3 in the opposite direction. This base pairing between the Schein-Delgarno sequence and the ribosomal RNA recruits or positions the bacterial ribosome exactly where it needs to be, just in front of the AUG start codon. This is how we get appropriate positioning of the bacterial ribosome in bacterial cells. In our cells, completely different. We have no Schein-Delgarno sequence whatsoever. We have no ribosomal RNA that's capable of this type of base pairing. 
In our cells, eukaryotic initiation factors are responsible for beginning translation. They are called EIFs, eukaryotic initiation factors. There's a whole slew of them, and we won't go into them in any good de great detail. It's just important for you to have some general idea of what they do. The first EIFs responsible for initiation of translation in our cells bind to the 5' prime cap of the messenger RNA and also bind to the small ribosomal subunit, bridging those two together. This first EIF is called EIF4E, but that's not critical for you to know in this course, but EIF4E binds directly to the 5' prime cap of our messenger RNAs in eukaryotic cells, and also simultaneously bind to the small subunit of the ribosome. This, in essence, recruits the small subunit of the ribosome to the 5' prime end of the messenger RNA, where the cap is. The next round of EIFs bring the methionine initiator tRNA to the start codon. EIF2 is responsible for that. Additional EIFs bring the large subunit to the, of the ribosome to the messenger RNA and position it such that the initiator tRNA is in the P site. So these EIFs are kind of like chaperones in a way. They're like guardians or guides that bring the appropriate translation factors together in the right order, in the right sequence, at the right time to accommodate the beginning of translation. I hope this also highlights for you the importance of the 5' prime cap of messenger RNA. Remember that weirdo methylated guanine we had with all three phosphates upside down and we said that marks the cap? mRNA capping was one of the three processing steps we've talked about uh, where we also had splicing and tailing. This is one of the main importances of that 5' prime cap. Without the 5' prime cap, EIF4 would have nothing to interact with. Without that 5' prime cap, there would be no recruitment site for the small subunit of the ribosome. Without the 5' prime cap, we could not initiate translation. Without the 5' prime cap, we couldn't make proteins, which in the end means without that 5' prime cap, we would be dead. The 5' prime cap is critical. Critical for cellular machinery to recognize the beginning of messenger RNAs for the purpose of initiating transcription. No cap, no translation. No translation, no proteins, no proteins, you're dead. Okay, so I'd like you to kind of realize or keep in mind, because we're doing this out of order chronologically, I don't want you to lose the linearity of this, that we have, what we have just discussed in the context of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells is initiation. What we have accomplished both in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells is getting the methionine initiator tRNA in the P site. That's what we've had happen. We have the methionine initiator tRNA in the P site at the start codon. The very next codon in our sequence is positioned in the A site. And so a new amino acyl tRNA with the appropriate anticodon for that sequence will enter the A site base pairing with that codon. What's next? Next is the formation of a peptide bond between methionine and the amino acid on that second tRNA. This makes this second tRNA, by definition, a peptidyl tRNA because it is carrying not a single amino acid but a chain. That is going to trigger translocation. The ribosome will move forward. I'm switching to the figures from the previous explanation because this fig set of figures didn't carry forward, but you understand, I hope. This ribosome translocates forward, putting the purple methionine tRNA in the E site, the blue second tRNA in the P site where it belongs, and vacating the A site. After that, our third tRNA will come into the A site. Can't have more than two tRNAs in at any one time. So there goes your initiator tRNA. Bounced out the E site. What's going to happen? Peptide bond formation between these two. Severing the bond between this amino acid and its tRNA. That creates a peptidyl tRNA in the A site, which will trigger translocation. Wash, rinse, repeat. Before I go any further, I just want to highlight the fact, I think I said it once before, but it's important to stress, that because AUG codes for methionine, and AUG is the start codon, every single protein in every single living thing on this entire planet begins with methionine.
Now, if amino acid sequence dictates protein shape, and if protein shape dictates function, you might, if you're particularly astute at this point in the lecture, say, well, maybe not every protein needs methionine at its beginning. Maybe not every protein should have methionine at its beginning. And you'd be absolutely correct if you said that. Many, many proteins are processed after translation, just as messenger RNAs are processed after transcription. And part of some protein processing is snipping this methionine off of the amino acid chain. But in their infancy, while being produced, every single protein on this planet is born with a methionine. Okay, so translation initiation is pretty complicated, especially in our cells with all these initiation factors, but even in the prokaryotic cells with the shine delgarno sequence and scanning and all of this ribosome assembly, etc. So just like was, was, what was the case for transcription initiation, the complexity and the challenges and the difficulty in initiating translation makes the initiation of translation an ideal point of regulation. Things that are very, very hard to do in the cell are very, very easy to block. And so since it's so hard to start translation, it's easy to block translation. And if you're done making your protein and you don't want any more, translation initiation is a good place to interfere with this process to stop the cell from making more protein. So that is all how we begin the process of making proteins. We also must end the process of making proteins. That's translation termination. And translation termination is quite a bit more straightforward than initiation itself. In both eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells, the termination of translation is signaled and controlled by proteins called release factors. And release factors bind to and recognize stop codons. We've said it before, but it's worth reviewing that there are three stop codons in the genetic code, and each of them is equally efficient at terminating translation. Once translation is complete, and a stop codon has entered the A site, release factors, which are proteins, enter the A site as well, and they, release factors, bind specifically to the stop codons. There are no transfer RNAs in the cell which possess anticodons to recognize stop codons. There are no tRNAs that recognize stop codons. As soon as a stop codon is in the A site, a release factor protein must enter the A site as well to recognize it. So here we see the, a, the UAG stop codon positioned in the A site. We have our long chain of amino acids coming off the peptidyl tRNA. There's no tRNA for that stop codon, so a release factor protein enters the A site and associates with that stop codon instead. One of the things that release factors do is cleave the bond that holds this amino acid to the peptidyl tRNA. So release factors will cut this bond, but obviously there's no peptide bond to make with any additional amino acid, because this guy isn't a tRNA. So when you sever this bond and you make no new bonds, this entire chain of amino acids is going to float away from the ribosome. So release factors release the polypeptide chain of amino acids from the tRNA in the P site by severing that bond, freeing that protein from the ribosome. Now with that proton, protein free, it can go fold up into its three-dimensional shape and carry out the function it was made to do. The ribosome, though, is fooled and believes that it now has a peptidyl tRNA in its A site, so it translocates forward, or at least it attempts to. The large subunit of the ribosome translocates forward, the smaller subunit can't translocate with it, and this causes an instability of the ribosome and eventually results in the dissociation of the large subunit from the small. Once the large subunit floats away from this process, the small subunit loses its stability, it floats away as, low, as well. Nothing is holding the release factor in place, so it dissociates as does the last remaining tRNA. In a nutshell, everybody recycles and no one is destroyed. This large subunit of the ribosome is still competent to begin and participate in another round of translation somewhere else in the cell.
Same can be said of the small subunit. The release factor is unharmed. It can go and terminate translation somewhere else. And this tRNA can also be recharged with another tryptophan amino acid and can be used in subsequent cycles of translation. Again, the newly folded protein that we just made is now competent and can go and do the job that it was made to do. So, I strongly encourage you, if not insist, that you watch movie 7.8, which is posted on Canvas. This movie is, I think, outstanding at showing the basic processes, the basic function of translation and, and termination. In addition, there's a YouTube movie that was posted. It's actually some kid's AP biology homework assignment, but this kid just did an amazing job at using construction paper and stop animation to capture almost everything that goes on in the process of translation. So I've posted a link to that YouTube movie as well, and I encourage you to watch it also. It is my hope that with this explanation, as well as the figures from your textbook and the movies that I have posted, that the process of translation will become fairly intuitive and understandable for you. But if not, of course, please come see me in office hours or after class, and we'll make sure to get this um, cleaned up for you, get it all straight. All right, so we're going to end this lecture with just three separate and very brief discussions on topics related to translation in the ribosome, but not directly pertinent to protein manufacture itself. The first is this idea that the ribosome is a ribozyme. So protein machines, that is, proteins that catalyze function, proteins that do dynamic and active things, are referred to as enzymes. All enzymes are proteins. And enzymes are proteins that have a distinct three-dimensional shape. That structure gives them a unique cellular function. And so enzymes do things because of the shape that they take. More recently, it has become clear that through intramolecular base pairing, RNAs can also fold up into three-dimensional shapes. And when some of those RNAs do fold, they too have function, catalytic function, very much like enzymes. But only proteins can be enzymes. So what do you call a ribonucleic acid that has a three-dimensional shape and a resultant function? You call it a ribozyme to encompass the idea that it has enzymatic-like activity, but it is made of ribonucleic acid. So RNAs that fold up into three-dimensional shapes and have function are called ribosomes. The ribosome, amazingly, in all its oversized glory, is only about one-third or 33% protein. The remaining two-thirds of the ribosome is RNA. This beautifully awesome picture is the ribosome. Amazingly, scientists have been able to determine the overall three-dimensional structure of the ribosome using a technique called X-ray crystallography. It is just astounding that they could do it with something as big as the ribosome. In addition to that, they managed to crystallize and determine the function of the ribosome with all three slots filled with transfer RNA. So what you see here is a transfer RNA in the A site, the P site, and the E site in yellow, orange, and red, respectfully, respectively, excuse me. Uh, the reason they could get three tRNAs into the ribosome is because this is experimental conditions. This isn't in a living cell. So you could jam things in where they shouldn't go experimentally. But point be made, this is the ribosome as it appears. This is the shape of the ribosome, which gives it its function. Here is the ribosome with its RNA only. So all of the proteins have been stripped out of this ribosome, and we are looking only at the RNA component. Now that's with the exception of the L1 domain. Now this is protein here in green, but this is the only protein on the figure. Now if structure equals function, if the shape of a complex allows it to do its job, what does it look like to you is responsible for the shape of the ribosome. Strip away all the proteins, and what you're left with is something that looks almost exactly the same. So amazingly, both intuitively by looking at the shapes and also experimentally by testing the idea, it has become clear that the RNA component of the ribosome 
is what not only gives it its structure, but also what gives it its function. The RNA components of the ribosome allow the ribosome to catalyze peptide, bind, peptide bond formation between amino acids. What we're really saying is that it's the RNA portion of the ribosome that builds amino acid chains. The main function of the ribosomal proteins appear to be accessory, corollary. They appear to be guiding the fine and precise folding of the RNAs, making sure they assume the right particular structure. The ribosomal proteins appear to be involved in stabilizing the shape of the ribosome so that it doesn't unravel or fall out of its necessary shape, but certainly it has been demonstrated that the proteins are not directly involved in any of the catalysis or activity of the ribosome when it's engaged in protein synthesis. Amazing! Amazing! How can this be, you wonder? If proteins are so damn important, how can it be that proteins are not responsible for the most critical aspect of life, which is protein synthesis? Why is this so? Why is an RNA complex building proteins which life is built on? The answer is quite simple. It comes back to the RNA world hypothesis. Life, if you can even call it that, Organized, self-replicating information on this planet began as RNA. Once the Earth cooled, and the oceans were rained down, and biomolecules were spontaneously forming in those oceans, the very first organized activity that could possibly be imagined was the activity of RNA. RNA was pretty good at catalysis, but not great. RNA was pretty good at holding information and being self-replicated, but not great. But RNA could do it both. And some of those RNAs mutated and changed and adapted to become DNA, which was much, much better at holding information but couldn't do a damn thing. And some of those RNAs, they had enough information in them that they could actually take some of those free-floating amino acids that were floating around in the ocean and pop them together into chains. And wow, those chains of amino acids were so much better at catalysis as the protein, as the RNAs themselves. And so as we've said before, RNA became the long and ancient intermediate between these two processes, between the two spectrum differences of DNA and protein. But RNA remains the middleman. And now RNA not only remains the middleman in the sense of the messenger RNA carrying this, the information from DNA to protein, RNA even remains the middleman of manifesting that information in a messenger RNA to protein. I don't go in it, into it in any great detail because we simply don't have the time. This is a long lecture to begin with. But the last portion of this chapter, chapter 7, has an very, very good write-up on the RNA world hypothesis in general. So if this is something you find interesting, please, I encourage you to check out those pages in the text. You're not responsible for them directly on any um, uh, exam, but uh, certainly interesting reading. All right, on to this idea of polysomes. Remember, these are going to be three short little discussions on three somewhat unrelated topics. So uh, done with the ribosomal, ribozymal aspects of protein synthesis, and now on to polysomes. Hopefully some of you remember how we compensated for relatively slow transcription rates. We talked about replication being very, very, very fast, but transcription wasn't nearly as fast, and we talked a little bit about how cells compensated for that, and the big take-home message was that there was nothing stopping one gene from being transcribed by multiple RNA polymerases at one time. In other words, a, a highly transcribed gene would be coded with RNA polymerases, each at a different stage of transcription, and so in one minute you might make 10 molecules of messenger RNA because you had this kind of marching army of RNA polymerases down the, the gene. The same is true for protein output during translation. At any one time, a single messenger RNA can be translated by multiple ribosomes. Now, of course, those ribosomes have to be spaced out on the messenger RNA, so that implies that each is at a different point of translation. But by having multiple and simultaneous translations occurring on a single messenger RNA, we make more protein per unit time. In fact, for any messenger RNA that is at its maximal output, it is literally coated with ribosomes. 
a new ribosome will assemble on this messenger RNA as soon as the 5' prime end of that messenger RNA has been cleared and the preceding ribosome has moved out of the way. I like to think of this as uh, landing a plane on the runway as soon as the preceding plane has cleared that runway. So never is the runway free of a plane, just as never is the 5' prime end of a messenger RNA free of a ribosome. <coughs> Excuse me. So any messenger RNA with multiple ribosomes on it, whether it's completely coated with ribosomes or just has more than one, is referred to as a polysome. And movie 7.10 is quite brief. It's posted on Canvas, but it shows this in very good detail. It does a very good job of showing how polysomes function. Here is a static schematic of a polysome. Actually, the animation 7.10 is based on this figure, but obviously this figure doesn't move. But you can see this is a messenger RNA at its maximal output, and there's not a single bit of real estate on that messenger RNA that hasn't been colonized by a ribosome. If a ribosome can fit on this messenger RNA, that ribosome is on this messenger RNA. And then to give you the idea of constant coding, this ribosome here has encountered a stop codon. It's about to dissociate due to translation termination. That's going to allow this ribosome to move forward to that stop codon. This ribosome will move forward. All of these ribosomes will move forward as soon as this ribosome has cleared the messenger RNA. Once this ribosome moves forward by one codon, it has cleared the 5' prime end, and a new ribosome will assemble there. So you always have the same number of ribosomes on the polysome. It's just as one falls off, another one comes on. So we're constantly making protein off of this messenger RNA. And of course, it goes without saying that each ribosome is at a different point of translation. These ribosomes near the end have made most of the protein, so most of the amino acid chain has been manufactured, and we see that in dark green. These ribosomes near the 5' prime end are still in the early stages of translation, and so their amino acid chains are quite short. This obviously is a schematic of a polysome, but this is a true polysome seen through an electron microscope. And you can see the structure is the same exact thing. The ribosomes are so damn big, you can see them clearly, even in an electron microscope. And you see they take this curled kind of snake-like shape, and we also see no available real estate. This messenger RNA is indeed coded. Both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells have polysomes, but only in bacterial cells can we have the exploitation of simultaneous transcription and translation. That is to say, only in bacterial cells can we have a DNA gene being transcribed, and as that messenger RNA is still being made, still being transcribed from the DNA gene, it is already being translated by ribosomes. We're going to use this as one of our in-lecture questions and talk a little bit more about why this can occur and how this can occur in prokaryotes, and more importantly, why it can't occur in our cells. All right, so that's polysomes. Now let's talk a little bit about antibiotics. Conceptually, in their basic, basic frameworks, prokaryotic and eukaryotic translation are nearly identical. Everything I've told you today could be loosely and conceptually applied to both systems. But mechanistically, in the details of how these processes work, we see a great deal of differences. What the individual ribosomal RNAs do, what the individual proteins do, and how molecules are behaving in the process tend to be different in the details. So the individual proteins are different, as are the detailed mechanisms of the process. I ask you how many of you have been sick lately? This is the time for it, for sure. Flu season, a lot of people coming down with colds. Many of those colds are bacterial. All of us, I'm sure, have taken antibiotics at some point or another in our lives, probably more recently than we wish. Antibiotics are our primary medical defense against bacterial infections. Anybody who has a confirmed bacterial infection is given antibiotics as a result, and those antibiotics kill the bacterial cells that are invading our body. Almost every single antibiotic that is used for medicinal reasons are nothing more than small, soluble molecules that interfere with bacterial translation. What makes them potent antibiotics is that they interfere with bacterial translation, but not our own translation. Obviously, any molecule that would interfere with our translation would kill us. We couldn't make our own proteins, our cells would die as a result, and we would follow suit soon after as the organism.
So by exploiting these differences between bacterial translation and our own, we can choose molecules that inhibit bacterial translation but leave our systems alone. This is Table 7.3 from your textbook. This shows five of the more common antibiotics that are used to treat um, human infection, and it provides their specific translational effect. So you probably have heard of at least some of these before, tetracycline, streptomycin, chloramphenicol, cyclohexamide, and rifamycin. Most of the antibiotics we take are derivatives of these. They have their fancier kind of names, the names that they're given by the, the pharmaceutical companies that make them. But most of the common antibiotics that we receive are based on or derivatives of these five compounds. What does tetracycline do? Well, tetracycline blocks binding of the aminoacyl tRNA to the A site of bacterial ribosomes. You know what that means now. Tetracycline gets in the way of tRNAs that are carrying single amino acids from entering the A sites of ribosomes. It's easy to envision how that would block translation. Without tRNAs entering the A site, we can't build our polypeptide chains of amino acids. And without making proteins, bacterial cells will die. Streptomycin prevents the transition from the initiation complex to the elongating complex of the ribosome. So once your methionine tRNA is in the, t in the P site, and it's time to kind of shed those initiating factors and move instead to the elongating form, the wash, rinse, repeat form of the ribosome, you can't do that in the presence of streptomycin. Streptomycin blocks that process. Chloramphenicol blocks the peptidyl transferase reaction on ribosomes. The peptidyl transferase reaction refers to moving that bond from the amino acid or moving that bond that is between the amino acid and the tRNA and the P site and instead creating a new peptide bond between the amino acid in the P site and the amino acid in the A site. Chloramphenicol blocks that bond transfer. Same net effect. If we can't create a peptide bond between the amino acid in the A site and the amino acid in the P site, we cannot make chains of amino acids. Cells will be unable to create protein and those cells will die as a result. Cyclohexamide blocks translocation. Well, that doesn't really require any explanation. If the ribosome can't translocate, it can't move forward. If it can't move forward, it can't translate new codons. And without that, we will not be making new protein. Rifamycin is actually affecting an upstream, upstream in the pathway of making protein, uh, upstream step. Rifamycin blocks um, RNA polymerase transcription processes, so not really falling into the translation aspect of this lecture. But at least the first four antibiotics on that list interfere with very precise, very specific aspects of translation, which we are now aware of and now understand. What makes this medicinally relevant is that when the bacterial cell can't make proteins, it dies. If you couldn't make proteins, you would die. So what we're doing medically is exploiting the differences between our details of translation and bacterial tr details of translation and using chemicals that affect bacterial translation while leaving our systems unaffected. Since the patient's translation is still functioning, the patient can still make proteins and the patient is left unharmed. What I think is amazing is the genesis of these molecules. How did these molecules arise? Certainly humans aren't smart enough to come up with them from scratch. All we do is pillage life that's already evolved on this planet. All of these small molecules that exist as antibiotics, they were made naturally by other microorganisms. See, at that microorganismal scale down there, on the, on the surfaces of fruit, and deep in the soil, all the places that microorganisms have colonized, they are constantly waging war on each other, fighting for the limited resources in their environment. So for example, bacteria and yeast are constantly fighting for the same resources. The bacteria will make compounds to destroy yeast processes, trying to kill yeast, and the yeast will make compounds to destroy bacteria. In addition to that, Bacteria are constantly fighting against each other. Different species of bacteria make different compounds, different small molecules, to kill other bacteria. So one bacterial cell 
will make tetracycline to fight and kill another bacterial cell that is trying to colonize the same environment. There's only a limited amount of resources in that environment, and species one wants it all for itself, and so it tries to kill off species two. Now species two is trying to thwart that attack. So over time, species two will evolve defenses against tetracycline so that it can survive a tetracycline attack and continue to invade that resource. What that means is that not only are antibiotics naturally occurring, but antibiotic resistance is also naturally occurring. See, this constant battle between bacterial cells trying to kill each other and trying to survive those attacks gives rise to new evolved antibiotics, as well as constantly evolving antibiotic resistance. Antibiotic resistance is nothing more than a bacterial cell's defense against an attack that it is experiencing. So it's a, an amazing system. And then what do we do? We go in there, we discover these molecules, we see that they don't hurt eukaryotic cells, they don't hurt people, but they're capable of killing bacterial cells. And so we isolate those antibiotics, we harness them for our own medicinal purposes, and, and we cure disease that way. I'll leave the abuse of antibiotics out of this discussion, but obviously we've overused these molecules as well and created a, quite, a, quite a problem for ourselves. All right, our last conversation here is on protein destruction. We spent the entire lecture talking about how proteins are made, but of course there must be some regulated and active process to destroy proteins as well. Nothing lasts forever, after all, so things must die. Even proteins have a, have a set timeline or a set lifespan. The problem with letting proteins die of natural causes, if you will, is that once a protein begins to age, it begins to break down. And proteins that begin naturally breaking down sometimes use their regulation, lose their regulation. They also sometimes lose their specificity. And the take-home point is that they often do things that they're not supposed to do. So the cell has an active mechanism to recognize aged and damaged proteins and destroy them on site in real time before those old or damaged proteins do things that would harm the cell. So much like messenger RNAs have different lifetimes, proteins do as well. Some proteins last for years. Some rare proteins actually last the lifetime of the organism. We have a very limited number, but we do have proteins in our body that were made in utero and will be with us on the day that we die. Some proteins we have last only hours. So different proteins have different lifetimes. Also, Again, damage and misregulation of proteins can target them instantly for destruction. Even a very young protein, if it has become damaged or misregulated, uh, can be targeted for destruction so that it doesn't wreak any more havoc. Once the protein is destroyed, once it has been targeted for destruction and it has been shredded, it doesn't go to waste. The individual amino acids are recycled for future rounds of translation. You might remember we even made this point for messenger RNAs. The ribonucleotides of messenger RNAs were never completely wasted, and they were broken down to their individual nucleotides, and then they were used to build new messenger RNAs. And the same is true of proteins. The amino acids from destroyed proteins will be used for subsequent rounds of replication. Obviously, the process for destroying pr proteins must be highly regulated. We can't just have these enzymes that kill proteins running around the cell, killing any protein they find. That would instantly result in cell death. The cells, the, the proteins that are needed for destruction must be clearly recognized, must be specifically labeled, and must be destroyed in a very organized and regulated way. Proteases are the name, is the name used for enzymes that destroy proteins. So proteases are protein enzymes that shred or destroy other targeted proteins. The most efficient protease is a very large multi-protein um, multi complex called the proteasome. The proteasome is really a protein shredder, almost like one of those mulching machines that's used for large yard waste. The proteasome breaks proteins down into two and three amino acid long fragments. So it literally is a protein shredder. This is the proteasome seen here. It has two caps on either end, shown here in kind of a bluish purple. The center of the proteasome is a cylinder here in yellow, and that is the shredding domain. And the green ribbon that you see is the protein that's been targeted for destruction. You can see it's unraveled and fed into the shredder. 
where it's destroyed, shredded, 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 and out the back end of the proteasome comes the small fragments of peptide. Again, these are usually two or three amino acids in length. Certainly the protein has been destroyed here. This is more of a scientific view of the proteasome. Uh, this was determined using electron microscope as well. But here we have the lid. The lid is not only the cap of the shredding unit, but it's also the protection to the cell. See, to enter this shredding domain, you must have a very specific tag, which we'll get to in just a second. But only with that tag will you be fed into the proteasome. Any protein missing that tag can never enter the proteasome. So the lid serves as the safeguard or the gatekeeper of the proteasome, assuring that only proteins that should be destroyed are destroyed. Again, in orange is the shredding domain, and all those fragments will come out the back end here. To enter the proteasome and be shredded, the targeted protein must possess a very specific and unique tag. It's actually referred to as ubiquitin. So proteins are ubiquitinated, and only ubiquitinated proteins are destroyed by the proteasome. It is the ubiquitin tag that's needed to get by this lid gatekeeper and enter the shredding domain. So the cell has multiple different pathways by which it can recognize damage or old proteins. But once those proteins are recognized, they are ubiquitinated. And those proteins with a ubiquitin tag are fed into the proteasome and destroyed. No other proteins will ever be shredded by the proteasome. Getting this ubiquitin tag added to a protein is a highly regulated process that requires multiple steps and redundant checks to make sure the proper proteins are being ubiquitinated. Once a protein's ubiquitinated, that's it. There's no going back. Quite literally, the ubiquitination of a protein is that protein's kiss of death. Ubiquitinated proteins are destroyed. In the lab, by forcing it, you can get proteins ubiquitinated that shouldn't have been, and they are fed directly into the proteasome and destroyed. This is the last step of regulation. So there's no going back at this point. Some of you may have may be familiar with the Godfather movies. I'm certainly a fan. Uh, this is a scene from The Godfather where Michael Corleone, here, has found out recently that his own brother, Fredo Corleone, has betrayed him and his crime family. And so at this reception here, Michael gives Fredo this big brotherly kiss. Uh, but it's an angry kiss. It's fraught with um, contempt. And as the viewer of the movie, you know that that is the kiss of death. You know that Michael is giving Fredo the kiss of death. You know that Fredo's days are short and numbered. And sure enough, soon after in the film, Fredo is killed. And so this kiss of death is ubiquitination. As soon as a protein receives that, you know that that protein will not be around for much longer. We began these last two lectures of this unit knowing how important proteins were. We'd already stressed the point that proteins were everything to a cell. Now we know how proteins are made. We know how the information contained in DNA manifests into proteins. We know how a cell makes a protein using a DNA sequence. But please, I ask you to take a step back, realize and appreciate how critical it is for a cell to be able to regulate the expression of its proteins. We're going to hit on this quite in depth right after the exam in our next two lectures, but even now I'd like you to just appreciate how important it is for a cell to keep track of the proteins it's making and only make proteins that are needed. Needing a protein for a, for a particular cellular process and not having it is dangerous. Proteins are machines, and if you need the function of a machine and it's not made, the cell is in trouble. But realize, too, that it's just as dangerous to have a machine around that's not needed. Once that machine is made, it's going to do things in the cell. And if those things should not be done, you're going to have yourself a problem. So this implies that regulation is needed. Proteins should be made when they're needed and not made when they're not. That means proteins need to be kept off and gene expression thwarted when those machines aren't needed, and protein expression must be kept on, and gene expression promoted when those proteins are needed. The two processes we've discussed in the last two lectures, transcription and translation, are both multi-step processes. They both have many, many steps to get from point A to point B. Each and every one of those steps we've discussed provides a potential point of regulation, a place where the process can be promoted and helped to make protein, or inhibited and thwarted to stop protein production.
each of these points of regulations, each of these steps is a place where the cell can exert its influence and alter protein levels either to make those protein levels higher by helping the process or lower by getting in the process's way. These steps, as a general recap, are the initiation of transcription. Once the premature transcript is made, it has to be capped, it has to be tailed, polyadenylation, and it has to be spliced. Those are the mRNA processing steps. Once that mRNA is mature, it is exported from the nucleus. That mRNA is then subject to degradation. It can either last a very long time or be degraded right away. Translation must be initiated using the processes we talked about today. Translation initiation then occurs, a protein is made, but that protein can be targeted for degradation, either destroyed very rapidly or allowed to persist for a very long time. Each and every one of these steps is a potential point of regulation. By slowing down the rate of capping, by slowing down the rate of polyadenylation, by speeding up the rate of protein degradation, we can decrease protein levels. By blocking the export of the mature mRNA out of the nucleus, we can halt protein production. If the mRNA never leaves the nucleus, it can never be translated. We won't make protein. By speeding up polyadenylation and splicing, by inhibiting the proteases that break proteins down, we can boost protein levels and create more protein in the cell. So each of these steps is a point of regulation where protein levels can be manipulated. We emphasized in both the translation and transcription lecture that the most potent steps are the beginning steps. The initiation of transcription and the initiation of translation are the two most used, most exploited steps in these processes for manipulating protein levels, simply because initiations are the most difficult steps to accomplish, making them the easiest steps to block. However, all the details of regulation, examples of regulation, and describing these mechanisms, those will be the first things we get to after exam number one. This is the end of the exam one material here in this lecture, and we'll get to, trans to the regulation of these processes after that in the next unit. So let's summarize what we talked about in this lecture. We began with the idea that nucleotides are taken in groups of three when we're coding for amino acids. And three DNA or RNA nucleotides, when they code for an amino acid, are referred to as a triplet or a codon. Triplets and codons code for amino acids. The genetic code is our nucleotide to amino acid dictionary. We have 64 triplets or codons encompassing the 20 different amino acids. This gives us redundancy where multiple codons code for the same amino acid. tRNAs have on them a three base anticodon on one end. This allows them to speak the language of nucleotides. On their other end they carry the correct and corresponding amino acid for the codon that they recognize. Single tRNAs can recognize at least two different messenger RNA codons due to wobbling where G's in the tRNA can base pair with either C in the codon or U in the codon. Enzymes called aminoacyl tRNA synthetases are responsible for tRNA charging by placing the correct amino acid onto the tRNA. These synthetase enzymes, they use the distinct sequences of the anticodon as well as unique sequences in the amino acid acceptance point of the tRNAs in order to recognize the appropriate tRNA and put the correct amino acid on it. There are 20 different aminoacyl tRNA synthetases, one for each amino acid. Ribosomes are huge multiprotein and RNA complexes that come together to allow protein synthesis to be possible, but it's important to note that ribosomes are just coordinating enzymes. They just get all the players needed for translation in the same place at the same time, doing things properly in a coordinated fashion. The ribosome has in it A sites, P, an A site, a P site, and an E site. And these sites, along with the translocation of the ribosome, allow the tRNAs to come in appropriately, new peptide bonds to be formed between subsequent amino acids, and chains of amino acids to be made, which is, in fact, the protein. We talked both about the initiation and the termination of translation. We have translation termination due to stop codons and release factors. Translation initiation is different in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. In prokaryotes, we have the Schein-Delgarno sequence, and in eukaryotes, we have the EIFs.
The ribosome is a ribozyme, and so about one-third of the ribosome is protein, but the remaining 67% is RNA, and it's the RNA that gives the ribosome its shape and therefore its function. We ended up talking about polysomes, which is just this idea that messenger RNAs can be coated with ribosomes, all simultaneously translating that messenger RNA at the same time. And we wrapped up with the discussion of antibiotics and how we exploit the differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic translation in order to improve human health. We talked about the proteasome, protein shredder, and proteases in general, and how they target proteins for destruction. And we ended with what really is an intro to exam 2 material by just getting your mind working in this way of regulation. Each step of the processes in these last two lectures provides a point of regulation or a potential point of regulation where we can influence protein levels by influencing protein synthesis. This is the end of your exam 1 material and we will pick up again in our next lecture with the beginning of Unit 2.